Well, good morning. Man, it's good to be with you. Happy Sunday. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We are in our series, Iron Faith. We have this weekend and next weekend, and then Iron Faith is done. I will be, I will be sad. Won't you be sad? Yes, I will. I've really, really enjoyed this series as we've looked at the Christian faith, a faith that goes the distance. And if you're going to have a faith that goes the distance, you need to make sure that you have a fertile heart. You, you do remember that the Christian life is not about being perfect. It's about being fertile. It's about allowing the Lord to work in you and through you because you see him as your savior and king. So you gotta gotta make sure you have the right heart if you're going to go the distance. And then you need to make sure that you're part of a a good body that's going in the right direction, that you're submitting to coaches that that are leading you and challenging you to go in the right direction. It, you know, I always look at being a pastor as being, being a, a really tough coach. That I, we can have fun, but sometimes I'm just going to get in your grill. You okay with that? All right, good. And then you need to have some spiritual disciplines. You need to exercise. As a Christian, like, you need to exercise. Like, God wants you to do some work. God wants you to put forth some effort. And so you, you need to have these exercises that God's using to build your faith, to strengthen your faith. Then you need to understand that Pain and suffering play actually a vital role in the Christian life. That pain and suffering is actually producing perseverance. Pain and suffering are strengthening our faith. And so we looked at last week that we need to rest. We need to recover so that we can experience renewal and restoration. And so this, this series has been all about How do we run this race with endurance? How do we run well this life that is called the Christian life? Now, what's fascinating is the Apostle Paul and the author of Hebrews talks about how there there can be Christians that actually don't run well, that they're Christians, but they don't run the Christian life Well, so just because you know Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to run for him well. Look look at some of these passages. Uh, Galatians 5, 7, Paul says, you were running a good race. Now, I didn't do well in English because I'm from the South, but you were, that's past tense. You were, maybe some of you today, this morning, you were running well. You you were being faithful to the Lord. You were showing up. You you were enduring, but something happened. You were running a good race. And Paul says, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Then he also writes, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I mean, Paul wanted to run in such a way that disqualification wasn't even part of the equation. Like we need to be running well. We need to be following the rules. We need to be pacing ourselves well for King Jesus. Here's what the author of Hebrews says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. This is interesting. There are some things in our life, they're not bad. They're not sin but they are hindering us from running well. And then yes, then you have to factor into the the, the sin equation that yeah, there are some times, even as followers of Jesus, we get entangled with some sin, maybe sins, and they prevent us from running well. Now, when I was thinking about this idea of running well and pacing myself for the Ironman, I was thinking about the three things that I needed to run well. The first thing that I actually needed is I needed to train well. Now, I remember when I had determined that I was going to do my first full Ironman, I told Joni, and Joni, she was really concerned for me. And the reason why she was concerned for me is I showed you, if you were here last week, I showed you a picture of what happened in the half Ironman when I finished. I was on, I was out on the ground. Caleb was standing over me, pouring water on me. So, so in Joni's mind, she's like, 
if that's what happened, you did a half and you can't do no full. And so she's like, you need a, you need a coach. And I started to look at how much coaches were and is to just to hire a coach to help you train. That was $200 a month. And I'm like, that's not in the budget. So I looked at plans. So I got a training plan and I purchased it for like, I don't know, a hundred, 120 bucks. And I followed that plan to a T. So, so I trained well. Everything that that training plan told me, and they would send me, it would send me videos, it would send me articles. And so I, I, I trained, I, I, I digested the information. And then the second thing that I needed is I needed to prep well. I needed to prep well. So one of the things that I did not do for the half Ironman that I actually learned is that, you know, there's a science to endurance. I didn't know that. So I sweat a lot. And so when you're out there for, I mean, especially if you're doing a, a full Ironman, the average time is 12 hours. So you're gonna be out there at least, if you're just an average Ironman participant, you're gonna at least be out there 12 hours. So, so I knew that I was going to sweat a lot every hour. So I needed to replenish my, I needed to replenish my sweat. Not only with just liquids, but with electrolytes. And then I was going to be burning a lot of calories. I was going to be burning anywhere from six, you know, from 600 to 1,000 calories every 60 to 80 minutes. So I had to replenish my body with energy, with fuel, with carbs. So I, again, I didn't know that until I actually started to train for the full one. So I needed to prep myself. So here's what an Ironman athlete, here's kind of what they plan for. So this is their breakfast. This is a snack an hour or two before the start. This is their swim and then their bike. So 60 to 90 carbs every hour. And so they're, they're making sure that they're prepping all of the things that they need for some, sometimes anywhere from five to six hours to seven hours on a bike and then run, they need 40 to 60 carbs. They needed to make sure they had electrolytes. They, they needed to prep well. So when you think about the Christian life and training and prepping, everything that we've talked about over the last several weeks has about, been about training. So spiritual exercises, spiritual disciplines, that's training. Those are things that you need to do. So connect, cultivate, care, and commission, and all of the kinds of other spiritual disciplines. That, that's your training, your prep. Your prep is this idea of understanding pain and suffering and how it's going to be used in your life to produce something. Resting, recovery, that's prepping your body. Being mentally tough for every day that you engage in the Christian life, you need to prep well. But then the third thing that I actually needed to do was I needed to fuel and pace myself well on race day, as well as be aware of my surroundings. Like I had a friend who had done a full Ironman and he told me, I was like, you have any last minute words of advice for me before I run tomorrow? And he said, yeah, just have fun and don't kill yourself. I'm like, oh, thank you, man. Don't kill myself. But what he was saying is just, just pace yourself. Everything that you've done in your training and your prep has prepared you for that day. Just trust your training, go out and execute. But then also I needed to be aware because the day that I participated in my full Ironman in Panama City, Florida, almost 3,000 people also participated. Now, just on a side note, out of the almost 3,000 who participated, a little over 1,700 finished. Just think about that. See, and that's why this series has been so important because just because you profess Jesus doesn't mean you really know Jesus. So just because you, in some sense, you started going to church 20, 30 years ago, doesn't mean in some sense you really know Jesus. That's why if you truly have the Christian faith, you will go the distance. And so that's why the, the series was so important. But I, I needed to be aware of my surroundings. So when you get into the, the, the gulf there with almost 3,000 other people, like it's WWE. Like you're swimming and you need to be aware because they're not looking out for you. And then also you need to be watching the buoys because if you're not watching the buoys as you swim, you might be swimming to Cuba and not the finish line. And then you get on the bike. And so you're gonna be on that bike for a long time. 
And you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of other bikers because you cannot draft. So I can't get behind somebody really close and, and use them as this windshield blocker. I can't do that, so I gotta be aware of that. I gotta be aware of potholes because they, they're a real thing out there in Florida. We, we kind of run over them even in our car, but you don't wanna run over them in the bike. You also, you gotta be aware of rocks because if your tire hits a rock just right, you can puncture your, your tire. You need to be aware of cars. I, I literally almost had a car hit me that day. And I'm like, do you not see almost 3,000 people here? Like, why, why you gotta almost hit me? You, so you gotta be aware. And then when you're running, you need to be aware of your body. You, you need to be aware of your surroundings. And so in the Christian life, you and I, we need to be aware. We need to fuel ourselves to pace ourselves. And that's what this message is all about. And we will see how Jesus fueled himself, armed himself for the race. And so we're gonna, we're gonna look to Jesus, our King and our Savior, to help us understand how we can arm ourselves and fuel ourselves for the Christian race. Now, what's fascinating about Matthew 4 is that we're gonna find Jesus, he's in the wilderness, he's in the desert. And in this series, we've, we've talked about the wilderness quite a bit. Let me put up the, 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 the chart that I've, I've created for you. Now, again, Jesus comes over here. He dies for humanity. He dies for sinners, rebels, those who have committed treason against the high king. That's why you have the cross. He bridges the gap. And so this, this moment in time for the believer is the moment of time that we live in the wilderness. Like, like the Christian life is lived in the wilderness. Sure, we will have glimpses of glory, but, but this is not the end. This is not our home. We're just passing through the same way Israel was passing through the wilderness to get to the promised land. We're passing through the wilderness to get to the new city. And so what we will see today is that Jesus, he's in the wilderness. He's going to show us not only that he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who has defeated Satan, the world and the flesh, but he gives us the pathway that in the wilderness we too if we follow him, we trust him, we can have victory too in the wilderness and we can run well. So, so with that, let me, yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. So with that, let me give you the main point. I'm gonna say it in two different ways. To do well in the race, and I hope you, if you are a child of the king, I hope you wanna run well. I hope you didn't want to get to heaven and go, man, Jesus, by the skin of my teeth, I got here. No, I hope you don't want to say that to him. So to do well in the race, you'll need to arm your faith to overcome the obstacles you'll face. We're going to face some obstacles. We'll see here in just a second. To maintain the pace, you'll need to fuel your faith throughout the race. And I can't stress this enough. The Christian life is just one big, long race. And every day you wake up, every day I wake up, we are continuing that race. And so if we're gonna, if we're gonna maintain this pace, we're gonna have to fuel ourselves throughout the race. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Matthew chapter four. Here's what the word says. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, hey, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread because I know how hungry you are. Uh, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took Jesus to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. Oh, so Satan playing that game. I know the Bible too, Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And here's what Satan offers. I'll give you all these kingdoms, Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, be gone. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him, what? Only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Let's pray. Father, will you be glorified? Jesus, I pray that you would be the center of our lives that you would be the center of this message and that every single area of this church and of our lives would orbit, uh, orbit around your glory. And Spirit, I pray that you would minister, you would serve, you would care for us well, that you would draw us uh, to Jesus you would conform us and shape us more into the image of Jesus, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to receive. I pray for those who are not even running for Jesus. I pray that, that you would draw them to the beauty, the splendor, the grace, the power, the forgiveness of King Jesus, that even today they might start running for him. And it's in your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So here's what we're gonna do in our time together. We're going to answer three questions of how we can arm ourselves to overcome the obstacles we will face. And also these three questions will help us understand what we're going to need to fuel ourselves for this race of faith. Number one, the first question, who or what will we face as obstacles in this race of faith? So who or what will we face as obstacles in this race of faith? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the yeah. El Diablo for my Spanish, brothers and sisters. I say that, this is it's just all, way off point and haven't said this to anybody, but I was in El Salvador one year and I stayed at a hotel called El Diablo. Be the last time I stay there. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but... But Peter also writes, and I wanted you just to see this, this passage here, but be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I want us to know that we have one main enemy that we will face as Christians and his name is the devil. He's the devil. And so let me put up a chart just so that you can kind of see we have some obstacles. So this is the race of faith, right? And so remember you have these crosses, they get bigger the longer you are a believer. And the reason why they get bigger is because the more that you know Jesus and the more you become like him, the more you are growing in your faith. But I want us to know that there are going to be some obstacles, daily obstacles we're going to face as we become more like Jesus, as we know him and are known by him. And the first main obstacle is the devil. Everybody say the devil. And he can go to hell where he belongs. You ain't supposed to say it now. Yeah, I mean, but, but I know that we live in the 21st century and the year 2023 and people are like, do you really believe the devil? I actually really believe the devil exists. I believe he is a living being. The Bible from the very beginning in Genesis, Genesis 3, we are introduced to Satan, the serpent. And then in Revelation, we see he's there again and all in between. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this world. He is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. He is a deceiver. He is the prince of darkness. He's the father of lies. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches about Satan. Well, you can't see him. Well, neither can you see the common cold or the flu, but they exist. <laughs> see, the, the symptoms of the devil are quite obvious. 
when you look at what the Bible teaches about Satan. So you wanna know why our world is so jacked up? Yeah, it's because of the sin of humanity, but behind the sin of humanity is this deceiver, is this accuser, is this prince of darkness, the father of lies, of depravity. So when you look at darkness, let me tell you what you really are seeing. Satan at work in the world. And Satan, and now what's fascinating is that the spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness to encounter and have a showdown with Satan so that he could tempt Jesus. Now, here's a great question. What is temptation? What is temptation? Now, we would think of temptation as having these, these bouts to get you to be disloyal to the Lord, to displease the Lord, to disobey the Lord. Let, let me give you the definition in the context of Christian endurance. Here, here's temptation. To prevent you from becoming like Jesus and thus imaging or reflecting Jesus. Because again, we're, we're supposed to be running for Jesus. And the more we run for Jesus, the more like him we should become. And therefore, the more we should reflect Jesus. And so temptations in our life are to prevent us from running well for Jesus, to prevent us from becoming like Jesus, to prevent us from reflecting the glory and the renown of Jesus. So what we see with Satan and his temptation for Jesus is that he's really ultimately trying to thwart the plan of God, the mission of God. He's really trying to rob God of his glory. And so when you apply that to the Christian life, like us reflecting Jesus, us becoming more like Jesus is the goal of the Christian life because we were created in his image to reflect his glory. But when we succumb to temptation, Satan then is able to rob God of the glory due his name through our lives. Now, here's some things that I, I think is really, really important to know is that temptation from the devil's perspective is, is really trying to get you to be disloyal, to disobey the Lord. But temptation from the Lord's perspective is actually to confirm what he's already affirmed in you. So prior to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus is baptized. Now Jesus is not being baptized because he's a sinner. He is being baptized to identify with sinners. He's being baptized to identify with you and me. So Jesus, he's baptized by John the Baptist. When John the Baptist is bringing him up, you have this voice from heaven that speaks, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you have this dove descend on Jesus. So there, just that picture, you have God the Father speaking, you have God the Son being raised from the waters, and you have the dove, the Holy Spirit, descending. Could you imagine being in that crowd that day and you hear this voice, see this stuff, you're like, oh my gosh. Like, and, and, and this voice is saying, this is my boy. I love him. I'm pleased with him. I'm proud of him. And then the very next chapter, the spirit of God leads Jesus to be tempted by the devil so that God can confirm in Jesus what he just affirmed in. See, see the reason why, so every day, every day, I, I, don't, I don't want you to miss this. Every single day, if you are a child of the king, you will face temptation. I will face temptation, but I, I don't want you to be scared of temptation as a believer. Because Satan's, his, his temptations are trying to distort what God's already done in you. And so these temptations, and here, 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 here I, I, I'll give you this principle. So this is really good. Temptations are opportunities for confirmation. Just to confirm what God's already affirmed, that you're his boy, you're his girl. Man, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You're my boy, Blue. 
That's what temptations are. But but doesn't mean that they're they're easy to overcome. Why are they not easy to overcome? Now again, the temptation is not the sin. It's the succumbing to temptation that is the sin. So, but, but why are temptations even hard to overcome? Well, uh, did, did, did you notice when Satan comes to Jesus? It is after 40 days and 40 nights. So it's day 41. Jesus is quite tired. Jesus is quite vulnerable. Jesus is quite hungry. Listen, I'm gonna tell you, Satan's not coming to you at nine o'clock when you're having your Bible study drinking coffee. Like, he might not even be present with you right now. And just so that you know, Satan is not omnipresent, he's not omnipotent, he's not omniscient, but he got a lot of minions that, do, that does his bidding, that do his bidding, okay? So I just want you to know that he's not God, but his temptations are very real and they're going to come when you are vulnerable. They're gonna come when you are tired. Remember last week, we talked about the witching hour between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, Beth, she confessed that she had the witching hour when she was on her way home. Uh, she, she was in a funk, didn't really know why she was in the funk, but she's tired, she's depleted. She's just yelling at God because of the sun. I mean, it didn't make any sense, but that's the witching hour. So that's when Satan's going to come. He's going to come when you're tired, when you're vulnerable, when, when you've had enough. Uh, men, we talked about this in our Proverbs gathering this past Wednesday, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. Let me tell you when you will be most tempted at lusting. You're going to be most tempted in the wee hours of the morning, at, at dark. And, and so around midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, when, when no one else is around, when your body is tired, when your mind is tired, when your mind is wandering, that's when Satan's going to show up. That's why if you've ever seen National Geographic, like I, I get these videos in my Facebook feeds now about lions and leopards and cheetahs at, attacking other animals. And it's always interesting because they're gonna go, they're gonna go for the, the most vulnerable, the, the isolated, the weakest. Saint smart. He, he's coming after you when you actually least expect it, when your defenses are down. And what will he do? Well, at least two things, at least two things. One, he's going to attack your faith. Is God really who he says he is? Is God really as good as, as you claim him to be? And then he's going to attack your identity. See, that's what he does with Jesus. If God's already told him, this is my son, and then Satan says, if you are the son. Satan's going after the jugular, your identity. And can I just encourage some of you this morning? Okay, yeah, you fell yesterday. Yes, you are struggling today. Uh, you, you have this habitual sin that you cannot seem to shake. But I want you to know, based upon the authority of God's word, if you have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, if you have repented and you have changed your mind and you are striving to follow him, I want you to know, regardless of how much you struggle, regardless of, of how hard you fall, you are a child of the king and don't you let Satan tell you otherwise. <laughs> Once again, when he attacks your identity, you can say you can go to hell where you belong because my name is written in the book. That was a little preachy there. That was a little preachy. I give, I give that to you. And now how will he do that though? He's gonna use your weak points as we saw, you know, said a few moments ago. He's gonna actually use scripture to twist them. So he knows scripture, a lot more scripture than you and I do. And then he's going to use God's plan, his ways, and the cost of following God's plan to get you to take an easier way out. Now, I wanna mention two other obstacles before I move on because these are really, really important and the Bible speaks of them elsewhere. But you have the devil, the world. So for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Church, I just, I have to constantly, I think, remind us is that we are not in war against people who are far from Jesus. That is not who we are in war with. We are actually at war to get them to see the beauty of Christ. Because the world, the, the, these, the, these powers of the dark world, they're, they're forces of depravity. 
They're, they're the forces of darkness, the forces of, of sin. And so when we engage the world, because we're to live in the world as Christians, but not of the world, there are gonna be times where the world is tempting us to behave just like them. The world is tempting us to think just like them, to operate in marriage just like them, to adopt their sexuality philosophy just like them. But, but what we have to understand is that these are obstacles that will prevent us from ru running well if we succumb to them. And then the third obstacle that we face is the flesh. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. So we are born in sin because of Adam and Eve. We are marred and tainted by the fall. But when we trust Jesus Christ as savior and king, he gives us his nature. He imputes to us his righteousness. But that doesn't mean that the old nature is completely done away with. It doesn't mean that it is obliterated. But the more we become like Jesus, the more we're going to reflect his kingdom and the less we're going to reflect the kingdom of man based upon our old sinful nature. But every single day that we wake up, we are going to face the obstacles of the devil, the world, and the flesh. And the question is, how do we overcome them? How do we arm ourselves? How do we arm our faith to overcome these obstacles and then to fuel us to maintain the pace as we run the race? Well, I'm glad that you asked because that's number two. Here we go. How do we fuel and arm our faith in this race? This is so, so important. I, mean, I, hope, I hope and pray that this is so practical for you because if you are a child of the King, these, these will be how you and I fuel ourselves. These will be how we arm ourselves for the Christian life and what it will be. These four things will be long obedience in the same direction. And what we read in verse one, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness. He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus also says, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And just so that you know, the reference to Deuteronomy is Jesus quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. So here are four ways. And if you're taking notes, I would really encourage you to take notes here. And uh, if you don't want to take notes and you want the easier way out in your worship guide, there's a little QR code. If you scan that QR code and you have the, and you have the version Bible app, it will bring up all of these notes for you. So as, there you go. You're welcome. We helping you out. But these are four ways, and I cannot stress this enough, four ways that we can arm ourselves, fuel ourselves for the race. Number one is we need to be led by the Spirit in the Scriptures. So Jesus is led by the Spirit. When you look at Jesus' life, he is conceived of the Holy Spirit. At his baptism, the Spirit of God falls on him. He is empowered by the Spirit to do ministry. And then he is encouraging his followers to wait on the Holy Spirit. Because he knows that apart from the Holy Spirit, they cannot do what Jesus is calling them to do. That the Holy Spirit for God's people are the comforter. He's the comforter. He's the guide. He is the power for God's people. And we see this with Jesus. He, he is leading Jesus into the wilderness. He is there with Jesus as Satan tempts him. And so that's why Paul will say, so I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of sinful flesh. Now, I know there's been a lot of confusion as to what does it mean to be led by the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. Let me help you out. I'm going to simplify it as best as I possibly can simplify it based upon the authority of Scripture. Let me ask you this question. How does one get saved? Or how is one redeemed? How is one delivered from sin? They're gonna repent 
of their ways. They're gonna repent of their sin. Like, I don't wanna live. I don't wanna live for myself anymore. I don't wanna be in charge anymore. I am a sinner in need of salvation. So I'm changing my mind. That's what repent means, is I'm gonna change my mind from walking the way I'm walking. And now I'm going to focus on you, Jesus. I'm gonna profess you as savior who has died for my sin and rose again. And I'm going to declare you and profess you as king. So it's repent, there's this profession, there's this confession of who Jesus is. That's how one is saved. That is how one is delivered. That is how one is redeemed. That is how one is forgiven. That's the only way. Like again, you cannot work your way up to God. You can't say, look at me, Jesus. Like, will you, will you just say, will you receive all the things that I've done for you and save me? No, 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 no. That is not how you are saved. It is through the repentance that you are a sinner and the confession that Jesus Christ is savior and king over your life. That's how you are are saved. And at that moment, guess what Jesus does? He gives you his spirit. He imputes his righteousness in you. And so you are filled with his spirit. So the same way you are ultimately filled with the spirit at the moment of salvation is going to be the same way you are filled with the spirit in the process of sanctification. Which is why every single day we live, what, we, what do we constantly do? I don't want to live for me. I don't want to live for my glory. I want to live for your glory. I repent of who I am. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve you. I want to worship you, King Jesus. You are my King. You are my Savior. Here's my life. Will you fill me with your spirit? Will you fill me with the power on high so that I might glorify you? That is what it means to be led and filled with the Spirit of God. And you and I need this. We need to be led by the Spirit. And then the scriptures. Did you see every time Satan attacked Jesus, he gave, he gave him the word. That's why your training and prep is so important because if you're not training in the word, I promise when you're tempted to disobey the word, it ain't coming out. It ain't coming out. We need the scriptures. The scriptures lead us, guide us, shape us, sustain us. The, skip, the scriptures rebuke us, reprove us. Like we need the scriptures. We're word-centered people. Second, this is good, this is good right here. We need to believe in the Lord's sufficiency. So not only do we need to be led by the spirit and the scriptures, but we need to believe in the Lord's sufficiency. So the first temptation Satan comes to Jesus and says, uh, you look really, really hungry. You're famished, Jesus. I mean, 40 days, 40 nights. I mean, I'm sure you're hungry. I mean, all right. So, so Jesus, listen, if you are, again, attacking the identity, if you are the son of God, there's some stones here and I know how hungry you are. Listen, all you got to do is convert those stones, like snap your finger, wave your little magic Jedi hand and boom, those stones will turn to bread. Now, here's what's so fascinating you'll never find Jesus performing a miracle to meet his personal needs. Never, you'll never find it. And so he responds to Satan, it is written that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so he's quoting from Deuteronomy and that passage in Deuteronomy 8 it reminds the children of Israel because they're getting ready to go into the promised land. But they had been in the wilderness for 40 years waiting on the older generation to die out so that they could go into the promised land. And so God is just reminding his people that listen, when you get into the promised land, you just need to, you need to be aware that you do not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of my mouth. Like if you wanna be successful in the promised land, don't be looking to stones or don't be looking to bread to meet your needs. You need to be looking to me because I'm all you need. So here's what, here's what Jesus is essentially saying to Satan. This is good. This is good right here. I don't live for that which will satisfy my belly, but unto the one who satisfies my soul. You know, we live in the day and age where there's a lot of self-seeking and self-serving people that are manufacturing bread to meet their needs to feed their 
bellies. I mean, we do that relationally. I mean, we have people that, I need to find Mr. Right. I need to find Mrs. Right so that they can complete me. No, you don't. Because if you're looking for somebody to complete you, you're looking for God. And I promise you, if it's just a human being, they ain't God. Amen. They are not God. And so, so some of you, you're looking for your spouse to really meet your needs. Well, I got needs. They ain't meeting them. Let me tell you, the only person you need to be fully satisfied is Jesus. That's the only person you need. Now, but what, we, but what we also see here in our world and what we struggle with, what we are tempted with daily is, you know what, I, I'm gonna slander, I'm gonna gossip, I'm gonna be malicious because if I do those things, then I actually feel a certain way. I got it off my chest. Or what about harboring unforgiveness or resentment or anger? because we, we feel the need to reserve something so that we can feel a certain way rather than releasing it to the Lord. Also in our lifestyle and, and materials. Well, I, I need that car. I need that house. And so, yeah, I know I can't really afford it. Yeah, I mean, going, you know, 96 month, you know, payments for that van. I mean, I, yeah. Because you feel like you need that. You know, for our Gen Z, you feel like you need to get in that college. You need to get in that graduate school. You need to make X amount of dollars so that you can feel successful. Listen, that's just manufacturing bread. You, you, you're familiar with gen genetically modified objects or, you know, GMOs? Listen, um... We, 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 need, we need divinely made bread. Because every single day we wake up, we are going to be tempted with trying to manufacture bread on our own to meet our needs or what we perceive is our need. And what Jesus is telling us is that there's only one who can truly satisfy our soul and meet our need. Number two, number two. Or right, number three. You can go to the next slide. We're gonna trust the Father's love. It's the third thing we're gonna arm ourselves with that we're gonna fuel ourselves with. So led by the Spirit, Scriptures, believe in the Lord's sufficiency, we're gonna trust the Father's love. So Satan says, all right, Jesus, let me take you to, let me take you on a field trip. We'll go to the temple. Very nice, beautiful temple. I'll take you to the highest point. And Jesus, here's what I know. Here's what the Bible says is that, man, like, God's not going to let anything happen to you. If you really are his son, God's not going to let anything happen to you until the appropriate time. So let's, 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 have, a, let's have fun today. Uh, let's, let, let's have you jump off the, the temple and let's let the angels come and just swoop in and miraculously save you. And people will follow you, Jesus. Like this will be an incredible entertainment thing, but it will also be a great time for you to exalt yourself. So if you just do this, and so Satan says, or so Jesus says to Satan, uh, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, what, what, what's that in reference to? Well, it's actually in reference to Exodus 17. God has just freed the, the children of Israel from Egypt. He's taken them to the wilderness and he's wanting to take them ultimately to the promised land. But just, I mean, just a couple of weeks into the journey, Israel they're grumbling and complaining against God. Oh God, you just brought us out of Egypt only to bring us to the wilderness so that you can kill us. I mean, there's no water here. And, and, and so what they're saying is like, God, we really don't trust that you love us. So if you really loved us, you would just magically let water appear so that we could quench our thirst. Here's essentially what Jesus is telling Satan. I don't put the father in a position to prove he loves me. I trust that he already does. I don't force God's hand, but I trust his heart. Because what Israel was trying to do, they're trying to force God's hand. Listen, if you really love us, you'll show up. It reminds me of our oldest son. And so I don't have to, you know, usually if I tell a story about my children, I have to pay them a little bit, you know, for rights. <laughs> Uh, but because this happened when he was 11, uh, we're, we're past that. 
But when he was 11, he came to Joni and me and he said, if you love me, you'll give me a smartphone. <laughs> like, like, I know you got a flip phone, but that's all you need. Like, we know my friends, I need, if you love me, you'll give me a smartphone. Like, so what he was doing, he was, putting, he was putting his parents to the test and he was saying, if you really love me, you'll do this. If you don't do this, you must not really love me. And see, we do that with God, don't we? God, if you love me, you'll heal my child. God, if you love me and if you're real, you'll give me this job. I mean, I've been terminated. I need you to come through if you really love me, if you're really real. If you really do care, you need, you need to make this thing go away. If you really love me, then don't let me face the consequences of my actions. And, and then, and then we, we get into this position of we're going to name it and claim it. God, I declare in your name that this happens. And, and what you're doing, you're snapping your finger and, and saying, I declare this in God's name. Let me... Can, can, can I be real for just a second? Well, you haven't been real? No, I have been real. So let me, let, me just, let me just be very frank with you right now. You and I can't demand anything from God. But we can ask him. You see, God is no circus animal. God is no genie in the bottle. God is not some wild horse that we break. God is not some dog that we train. Sit, boo-boo, sit. Good dog, thank you. I mean, uh, now, God is not that. God is the king of glory. God is the king of the cosmos. And here's the thing that we know in scripture. We don't have to put him to a test whether he loves us. We know he loves us. And, and again, in this series, we've already talked about pain and suffering. We know that he's doing something in our pain and suffering so we can trust him. We don't have to force his hand. We can trust his heart. And then, then the, the fourth thing that we're gonna have to arm ourselves with is we gotta live for the glory of God. We gotta live for the glory of God. Um, I love, man, I love, I love y'all over here. Y'all, y'all fill me up. Y'all fuel, you fuel this preacher. Sorry for all about, no, but it, <laughs> <laughs> So, so Satan's like, all right, he's losing. He's losing. He's 0-2. And I just want you to, I, you already know the end of the story. He loses. But so now he's going to try one more thing. So he's going to take Jesus. He's going to show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And he's like, hey, all of these kingdoms can be yours if you would just bow down and worship me. Now, on the surface, you're like, can Satan offer Jesus the kingdoms? He actually can. Because remember, remember that chart, you have the kingdom of man, Babylon, Egypt, the kingdom of God. Satan, he's the prince over here of the kingdom of man, the kingdom of darkness. So he rules that land. Now, he's still limited in what he can do because he cannot do anything outside the jurisdiction of God. However, this is his domain that God has allowed him to at least roam for a time. For a time, okay? But here's what we do know about the scriptures is that the nations are on God's heart. We, we see that in Genesis 12, when he calls Abram out, he says, I'm gonna bless you, we'll make you into a great name and nation, and through you and your descendants, Abraham, I'm gonna bless all the families of the earth. So every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every people group, through you, Abraham, I'm going to bless. So God's, God's he, his heart is the nations. So, so what, Satan is offering Jesus is a way to bypass the cross and still have the nations. So you don't have to suffer, Jesus. I'll just give you the nations. But if he bypasses the cross, then our salvation would be bypassed. And so here's what, here's how Jesus responds. Here's what he essentially says. He's like, I don't bypass God's will for Satan's ways, but bypass Satan's ways for God's will. I worship the Lord exclusively, even if it costs me everything. <laughs> Praise God that Jesus said, even if it costs me my life, I'll never disobey the Father. I'll never take the shortcut. I won't bypass the cross. I'll take what God wants me to have so that the nations can have life. But we are tempted as human beings, are we not? 
Because throughout the history of humanity, human beings have always chosen the pathway of Satan, the pathway of lies and deception and devastation and shortcuts. We've always chosen the fruit of the forbidden tree rather than the fruits of the trees of freedom. We've always chosen the pathway of the least resistance. Let's just go back to Egypt. Let's just do what everyone else is doing. We've always chosen the pathway of duplicity. Okay, God, we'll worship you along with Baal and Murduk and Dagon, and we'll worship you, Jesus, but also we wanna worship money and sex and power and pleasure and security and comfort and safety and happiness. Mankind has always chosen to build for ourselves great cities, great cultures, and civilizations that glorify our name. Yet it is here. Jesus, fully God, fully man, breaks the pattern of humanity and the pattern of God's people. And he does not choose the pathway of least resistance. He does not choose the pathway of the forbidden. He does not choose the pathway of pleasure. He does not choose the pathway of the shortcut. Jesus chose the path God marked out for him. A pathway that would take him to the cross. And so rather than and choosing the pathway that seemingly would bring life but ultimately bring death. He chose the pathway of death that would ultimately bring life. I want us to realize that every single day we have many, many little decisions, sometimes big decisions. And every one of those decisions, they're either leading to the path ultimately of life or ultimately of death. And here's how you can tell. Ask yourself this question, does this glorify God? Because that will tell you whether or not you are choosing death, but ultimately embracing life, or choosing seemingly life that will ultimately bring death. And so again, you can look at your marriage, other relationships, whether or not you love your enemies, how you glorify the Lord with your time, your talents, and your treasures. I could go on and on and on, and we'll talk about that in Extra Takes tomorrow, but here's the third question, and I'm done. Here it is. Where is our care team to serve us through this race of faith? Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Uh, so I, I just love this. I, I wanted to end here because I think it's so important that you have a care team. Who's, who's attending you? That word attend is where we get our word diakonos or deacon. They ministered, they served Jesus, they cared for Jesus because as you could imagine, he was flat worn out from running a long, long time. I mean, actually a month and a half, maybe even two months. He needed a care team. Northland wants to be that care team. Who, who's your handful of brothers or handful of sisters in your life that can care for you when the Christian life has kind of worn you flat out. So these are ways that we can fuel ourselves through the race to maintain our pace. And these are the ways that we can arm ourselves to overcome the obstacles we'll face. Let's pray, Father, will you be glorified in our lives as we seek to maintain this pace that you have marked out for us. May we run for your glory and your renown May we image Jesus well. I pray that the spirit of God would fill us. I pray the scriptures would saturate our hearts and our mind. Father, I pray for those who are even far from you. Will you draw them where they would just simply repent where they are? That I, I don't wanna live life on my own. I don't wanna do things on my own. I want to repent and I want to turn to you. I want to believe in you, on you. You are Savior. You are King. And I follow you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.